don't want to put the cart before the horse because we've been looking at, you know, God taking, God taking two churches and, and, and putting them together as one. Really, it's, we've already been one in Christ, right? We're one body in Christ, but now he's just taking these two households and, and, and putting them together. And I think it's important to remember as we press forward over the next couple of months uh, with the Vision Banquet next week, um, and over the next couple of months as we move into uh, to 2024 serving together as, as, as one church, that uh, we remember that and, and notice that these words that we've mentioned, that we've been looking at, um, these core values, these fundamental commitments that we make to one another, these are, not, these are not foreign to folks at Graceway because these are really just principles that as the body of Christ we need to engage in because each principle that we've looked at so far, they haven't been made up in a, in a room with a team of elders. They weren't just conceived out of thin air by Pastor Chris when the church started. These are words that we find within Scripture that we're commanded to, that we're commanded to embrace these concepts and to live our life by as a guide for our life and how we relate to one another within the body of Christ. And uh, so I think it's, it's been a healthy thing for us as a body as we've moved through this to just kind of rediscover it, refresh with it, uh, and go through that. We've looked at five words so far. You'll see those listed on the screen there. This, the first word was liberty, and that's what I, I think is really our, a, a positional word. It explains where we are in Christ, that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were enslaved to sin. Sin, but because of Christ, he has now freed us from that. And we have this new position of being free in Christ. And we have liberty in him, right? And we have great liberty in Christ Jesus. And we don't have to live by, by being bogged down by just trying to make myself better because I'm already made perfect in Christ. His righteousness has been imputed to me already. Then we looked at love, and this is the defining word. Jesus said that. He says, by this shall all people know that you're my disciples if you have what? If you have love for one another, this is what defines us as followers of Christ, that if we don't have love for one another, John said, then the love of the Father is probably not in you, right? So this is our defining word. We need to pursue being more loving to one another, being more loving to those that God would have us love, which by the way, the Great Commission says is everyone. Love them with the love of the Father. Love even, specifically Jesus even said, love our enemies as well. So we are to be defined by love. And then there were two occupational words, which are the words that kind of keep us busy. This is what we need to be about and what we need to be focused on. And that's, that's growth and service, that we are to grow in Christ. It's, it's only natural that living things, now that we've been brought to new life in Christ, it's only natural that living things grow. And how do we grow in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord? We get in the word. We, get, we begin to get to know the heart of the Father through reading his word, through studying it. We grow in that. We also grow through serving him by not just amassing knowledge and, and, and amassing what the word says to do and knowing what the word says to do, but also doing what it says to do. That we grow together and then we also serve one another and we serve as well. And then, this is more of a, a directional word that we looked at last week, which is the word of relationship. When I say direction, I almost want to say calibrate us. This is what keeps us on the right track. Sometimes, as we're, as we're, as we're doing this, this, this church thing, and as we're living the Christian life, we can lose kind of our bearings on what we're doing it for and why we're, why we're doing it, right? Relationship is really what helps us to get back and get our bearings. That I am in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he calls me to then have relationships with others that edify my relationship with him, but also call others to a deeper relationship with him as well. And I love the challenge that we had last week from Pastor Chris when he said, take time this week to just say, Are there, is there anybody in my life that's hard to love? Or is there anybody that I see that God, that's been kind of floating around on the fringes of my life that God has been calling me to intentionally invest in forming a relationship with them for the purpose of, of them coming to know the Christ that I know, using those relationships for that. Because life is not just about living, getting, dying. Life is about living, investing in others, knowing our Creator, and then living on with Him forever and eternity. And so those are the five words that we've looked at, and we kind of wrap up this, this morning with this last word, which I think kind of encompasses all of the concepts together, and I think it's the aspirational word, and that is the word of faithfulness. Because it's great to, it's great to embrace our liberty, it's great to have love, it's great to grow and to serve and to, to use our relationships for the glory of God, but we must be faithful in doing that. 
We have to aspire to be faithful because one day when we get to heaven, and we're going to see this in our, in our passage this morning through some of the parables that Jesus gave here. When we get to heaven, God's going to look at us and we want to hear that great and glorious commendation. Well done, good and what? Faithful servant. We want to be faithful. There is a possibility that we could get to heaven one day and not be told that we're faithful because faithfulness is up to us. Will we be faithful? Will we have a heart that is bent towards always being faithful to God? So let's look this morning at Matthew chapter 24, and we're just going to read verses 45 and 46 right now, and then we'll get to the last part of that that chapter, and then we're going to also look at 25 in just a few moments as well. But for our main text this morning, let's look at verses 45 through 46. It says this, who then is a faithful and wise servant? Your translation may say slave, or it may say steward whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. We know that the master one day, our master, Jesus, is going to return. The Bible says he's going to return in clouds of glory and trumpets and all kinds of stuff. Wouldn't it be nice that if we're not already in our grave, wouldn't it be nice if he returns while we're here that he finds us busy about his work rather than just kind of like, you know, phoning it in? This is what the scripture says. Who is a faithful and wise servant? It's the one who is going to be busy about the master's work when he returns. That should be our heart's desire. That should be the desire of every church, of every body of believers, that we don't just do this so that we can come together and have a wonderful, like, just get together every week. We exist as a lighthouse to shine gospel light into a darkened world and darkened community. And we each one have an individual responsibility with that. So would you pray with me that as we get into this? Father, speak to us now. Have your will and way in this time. And may we respond to you faithfully as you have as you lay upon our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we wrap up this series today, we come to the final word that we can say is that aspirational word on our list. We aspire, we should hopefully aspire to be faithful. This should be our desire, that when, that when Jesus returns, he will see me busy for him, that he will see that I am being faithful to him, and he will find me to be faithful to him and to what he's called me to do. Faithfulness is that word that encompasses all of the other stuff. If I'm being faithful with my liberty, I'm stewarding it properly to glorify God and not abusing it just to satisfy my own fleshly desires. Because it'd be easy for me to say, man, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. No sin is going to lead to my death anymore, like like eternal death. It's not going to send me back to hell. I'm eternally secure. I have liberty in Christ, so I might as well live it up until I get to heaven. No, when we steward our liberty, we realize that we're not just saved so that we can have spiritual Teflon as we live here on earth. We have liberty to share that liberty with others. If I'm being faithful with my love, I'm centered on the one who first loved me and has shed his love for others in my heart, and I need to love sacrificially like he loved me. If I'm faithful in growing in him, I'm becoming more acquainted with the heart of God in his word And I don't just take days off from him and say, you know what, I'm thankful for salvation and I'll see it in heaven, but I'm just going to have life on my own now. If I'm faithful in my service, I'm mindful with my eyes wide open to opportunities to be the hands and feet of Christ rather than just being bogged down in my own life and only seeking to serve myself and seeking from others what I can get for myself. If I'm faithful in my relationships, then I'm seeing that even the people that God has placed in my life Those relationships are things that I need to faithfully manage because one day I'm going to give an account for how I related to others. See, faithfulness is a kingdom principle. It's the way that God functions and it's the way that God calls us to function. God doesn't call us to do something that he is not already doing for us. It's like we talked about with the kids. God's not asking us to be completely loyal and faithful to him and he's just not faithful to us. No, that's not how God works. He sets sets kind of the bar and then we follow that. The concept of faithfulness, of our faithfulness to God as, as our master is mentioned over a hundred times throughout scripture. Over a hundred times. So what we can understand by repetition in scripture is if it's mentioned more than once, it's important. God mentions it a hundred times. And you know why I think that is? Because we're sheep. And sheep need to be reminded all the time. 
Sheep always need to be reminded of where we're going and what's expected and what God, what God needs. Because, I hate to say it, but sheep are dumb. God chose the dumbest animals in creation to, to use as a metaphor for us. All right? But gosh, dog, he still loves us, right? Faithfulness is a kingdom principle, and it's addressed over a hundred times in, in, in Scripture. In the passages we're going to look at today, he, he addresses it in a lot of different things. He, he expresses it in terms of the end times, always being ready, always being about the, the work of the Lord because we don't know when Jesus is going to return. He talks about who a servant really is when he talks about sheep and, and goats and divides those up. He talks about what happens to servants who are unfaithful. Or servants who just pretended that they would be faithful and chose not to be. But the overall concept, overall concept of these passages that we're going to look at today is how to be faithful and what to be faithful for. So the first thing that we need to understand about, about faithfulness is, first of all, is that God relates to us as his children. He relates to us as a righteous master to grateful servants. And we see that in our culture and in what we like to look, especially in, in America where we love our independence and our freedom, we don't like to look at that and like go amen to that, right? We like to look at it as we're princes and princesses of the king and we're, you know, we're royalty, which we are, but we're also this. We're also this. God relates to us as the righteous master to grateful servants, now, those, now those, those adjectives or those, I don't know, English, if there's an English teacher in here, don't kill me, but what's righteous and grateful? What, what, what are those word usages there? They're express, explanations, right? They're explainer words. That's the way I like to look at it. Jesus, God is a righteous master, right? He's not just a master because you can be a good master, you can be a wicked master, but God is the righteous master. That means everything he does is right. And he's a righteous master to servants who should be grateful for the fact that they are servants of the righteous master. So in our culture, it's a difficult truth to accept. And in some of your translations, it may even bristle you even more because you may be looking at a translation that servant is actually translated to slave. And we really, especially in our American culture, we look at that word slave and it doesn't really give us the same concept of what Jesus was really saying here in the passage. Because in our American concept, we look at slavery as chattel form of slavery. And what that is was people going in and subduing another people group and taking them against their will and putting them into forced labor with no return for it. And they were viewed as less than human and only as property of another person. We know that that is not only, that is not only wicked, but it is, it is devious and it is inhumane. This is not the kind of slavery that is being pictured here. And when, if you see that word slave in your translation, that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about was a more ancient Eastern thing that was, that was brought about in the, in the Torah where God laid out specific laws for indentured servitude, where a person could enter into an agreement with a landowner to work for them and for a period of time, whether it be years or whether it be, whether it be months or whatever, in return for something to be paid out at the end. We see that example, and this sounds very patriarchal and awful, but I didn't write it, okay? But when, when, uh, <laughs> when Rachel, when, um, when Isaac worked for, worked for Rachel, for how long? Or when Jacob worked for Rachel for seven years from Laban, so that he, 14 years eventually, right? He, he scammed him on that one, right? And uh, so if you remember that story from the Old Testament, when Jacob entered in and he worked for, Lab for Laban for seven years to marry his daughter, that's the kind of idea there. This is the kind of servant. The, the servant here listed is always has a return for his labor, right? So this is what we have to understand, that God calls us to a servitude of him. But he also calls us to understand that there is a return for our labor. God blesses our labor. So the point of all of this is that we're trained by society to look at that and see the many examples in Scripture of saying that we are to serve God, that He is our Master and our Lord, and we are His servants. We look at that, and we're supposed to bristle against that, Lord, and say, no, I thought God was all-loving, and I thought God called me and adopted me as His son or as His daughter, and I'm a prince or I'm a princess. I'm not a servant. You're right. You're not. But you also are. Right? We aren't, we, we are princes and princesses, but we are also servants of the master. How is that possible? It's because of the transcendence of God's nature. God can be everything and everywhere at all times. And we have this transcendent with nature with God as well. While we are royalty, we are also servants. 
We are a holy priesthood. Priests were servants of the Most High, so we are a holy and royal priesthood under him. So the, the, to properly pursue faithfulness, we have to accept the fact that God looks at us and says, you are my servant. There is an expectation of you. And he says this in the word. He says, moreover of servants, it is required that they be faithful. It is required that they be faithful. So the second thing that we see is this, is that faithfulness is a word that's used to describe also the nature of God. So God uses the word servant and faithfulness as something that he wants us to pursue for him, but he also is pursuing faithfulness towards us. So this is not the Lord and Master just lording over us and cracking his whip and, ask, and, and expecting things from us that he does not already, first and foremost, provide more faithfulness to us than we provide to him. This is what makes us so fortunate and what bends us or should bend our heart towards gratitude so much. Something I love about God is he will never ask of us anything that he is not already perfectly, completely, and consistently provided through Jesus Christ. He will never ask of us for that. How do we know this? And it's not modeled within his character. How do we know this? In Hebrews chapter 4, 15, it tells us this. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet he is without sin. What that's telling us is when Jesus came and lived as a man and put on flesh, he had every temptation we did. He faced Every illness and every human weakness that we did, yet he faced all of those and did it without sin, did not respond in a sinful way, did not respond in a fleshly manner. He's been where we are, and when he asks us to be faithful, he is faithful to us as well. Scripture is full of insight to the fact that God is faithful, and that's part of his character and nature. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm going to move through these passages, passages quickly, so if you can't find them manually, you can see them on the screen. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. What does it say? The Lord your God is a faithful God. He keeps his gracious covenant loyally or loyalty. He's going to be loyal to us, and it's not dependent on whether we're loyal to him. He's just always going to be a faithful God, always. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So God shows his faithfulness in the fact that he calls us into a fellowship with him. He calls us as the servants into fellowship side by side with our master. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, he who calls you is who, is what? Is faithful. And it says, he will do it. If he said he will do it, he will do it. And it's just as sure as if it's already been done. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 says, But the Lord is, beginning to pick up a theme now, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and he will guard you from the evil one. That word, the word faithful there, or that word talking about servants is pistos, which just defines a faithful person that shows themselves to be honest and having integrity in a business transaction. This is the way God is with us. He means if I've made a promise to you, I look at that as a contract and I will not break my contract. This is how he is faithful to us. This is the way God's faithfulness is defined each time. He's always faithful, never unfaithful. Now with us, we are sometimes faithful, sometimes unfaithful. You hope that by the time the whole life is over with, there was more faith and not unfaith. You hope. And you hope as you grow that the un part kind of diminishes and the faith part grows. But with God, it's always faith, never unfaith. Always. He always discharges his duties and he does it completely. He always can be trusted as both our heavenly father and our heavenly righteous Lord and master. Meaning that as he guides us, as he commands us as his servants, he will never command us with more than we can bear through him. And he will never command us into something that, is harm, that, that, will, that will bring us to spiritual harm. Never. Psalm 106 tells us that in his faithfulness, he's also faithful to bless those who are faithful to him. So what do we get? We get a return in our service. We are not chattel slaves. We are servants that re receive a reward. Psalm 101 says this, my eyes favor the faithful of the land so that they may sit down with me. What does it say the blessing of faithfulness is? 
that we draw closer to him. Kind of gives you the picture of, of an, after a night out on the fields, when you return from a long night, and you come in and you see your, you see your master sitting there with a campfire, and he's, got, and he's got, if it's hot outside, he's got some cold iced tea, or if it's, if it's cold outside, he's got some warm coffee. He says, sit down, let's talk for a little while. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of reward that we have for faithfulness to God. We are drawn to the heart of God, and we are drawn to see him in a more clear way. So God is faithful to us, and faithful to us so what should our response be? And that's the third thing. The response to his faithfulness to us should be, the third point, that the normal outflow of a believer should be a life of faithfulness with all that God has invested in us. God has given us all of this, and we deserve none of it, Doesn't he deserve our faithfulness too? You see, the proper mindset of being a servant of God or a steward of God is that nothing that I have came from anywhere other than God. Everything came from him. And so because he is such a righteous and benevolent master and has given me all of this, I need to be faithful with what he's given me. And I need to invest that for his glory. That I don't just spend everything I get that I invest it and grow that for the glory of God. And throughout the New Testament, commendable servants of God are repeatedly referred to as faithful or the faithful ones. There are also those who are referred to as unfaithful. And we see a completely divergent track and path for the faithful and the unfaithful, completely. Trust me, we want to be on the faithful path. And what we can take from this is the understanding that God is obviously interested in our faithfulness. Matter of fact, I repeat this again. Moreover, it is required of servants that they be found faithful. didn't say that they be found gifted, that they be found strong, that they be found highly educated, that they be found skilled, that they be found great, you know, great with, with whatever. It says that they be faithful with what they've been given. This is what God's looking for. He's looking for our faithfulness. So in Matthew 25, we're going to see this this example. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, is called the parable of the talents. And the story goes kind of like this. It says that there was a master or or a landowner or something like that that was about to go away for a long time, probably for years, for longer than a year, was going to go away. So what did he do? This is kind of the normal practice. He would call his servants, probably his most trusted servants, and would say, you are now keepers over my household. And he portioned out some of those things. And it says that he gave one guy, and it says according to their ability, according to what he thought they could manage, he gave one person five talents or five shares, five, five, five investment pieces. He gave another guy two, and then he called another guy and gave them one. And he said, and when I come back, we'll settle up on everything. So the Bible says that the man goes off, and these, these servants are standing there with all of these pieces of his wealth, and, and he didn't really give a whole lot of direction, and so they're left to, what am I going to do with this? So it says the guy with the five went out and he invested it, and the Bible says that he doubled the investment. So he not only took, had five talents, he now returned ten. And then the other one took two and now has four. The other one doesn't take and invest or do anything with it. He just goes and buries it in the ground. Now a couple things that we draw from that is, why does he bury it in the ground? He could be afraid that he would lose it. But there's another thought that he could also have said, if I bury this, I'll be able to give this back to my master when he comes back, and I got the year off. I can go do whatever I want, and as long as nobody touches this, when he comes back, I give it back to him, and everything is great. Master comes back, and all of a sudden, the guys come back, and he says, all right, it's time to settle up. And the guy with five says, hey, I went and invested it, and I have doubled what you gave me. And the master says, that's great. You've been faithful over little, I'm going to give you more. The guy with two, he says, I did the same thing. Now, I don't have ten, but I did double the same thing you gave me, and I have now four. He says, that's great, you've been faithful over a little, I'll give you more. The other guy comes back, (laughs) hey, man, (laughs) how you doing? And he says, all right, so did you do like these other guys did? Were you faithful? And he says, well, in a way. So you see, I was afraid that I would lose it. I didn't trust myself. And I didn't want you to be mad at me for losing your stuff. So I went out and I buried it and I kept it safe for you the whole time. So here you go. Here's your one talent back. Let's look at the response of the master. Look at verse number 27. Chapter 25. 
the master says, you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I return. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good for nothing servant or wasteful servant into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That outer darkness in the parable refers to being cast out of being cast out of his employ and just out there. We look at it and think, man, and we spiritually begin to apply this and we think, how important is it to be faithful to the master? How important is it to be faithful to the master? It's really easy to get wrapped up in the harshness of the master's response, but what we really need to hone in on is on the urgency of the issue. See, the issue here is the matter of faithfulness in matters of stewardship. See, stewardship is a term that we use to talk about how we manage what God has blessed us with. We can't even come to understanding stewardship until we come to understand that God is over everything, meaning that house that that has your name on on the mortgage, it's actually God's. The car that you're driving around, actually God's. The kids that you have, actually God's. Sometimes I'll look at my kids and say, God, why in the world are your kids acting like this? No, I'm teasing (laughs) <laughs> they're your kids when they're acting bad. They're my, no, okay. Um, anyway. <laughs> right? It means everything, we, we kind of understand that, all right? We understand that everything is God's, so we have to look at everything in a, manage, in, in a matter of, how am I managing what God has given me? How am I managing? We look at financial stewardship, which in the Bible is illustrated by the tithe, right? That we would give 10% of our first fruits back to the Lord's work or to the storehouse, which the storehouse is no longer the, uh, just the one temple there in Jerusalem, but it is the local household of faith, the church where we are part. Tithing requires to be obedient and to be faithful in that obedience. So I don't know about you, but most of us don't live where 10% is not a big portion of what we have, a meaningful portion. Faithfulness is always, faithfulness in giving is always going to be blessed though. God promises us this, that as we give, God will always bless. There will always be a return. Now, is it dollar for dollar? No. It may not even be dollars for dollars. It might be health for dollars. It might be peace for dollars. But he always returns. There's also evangelistic stewardship as well. If you look at this parable again and you replace talents with the gospel, we begin to see just how serious the matter of faithfulness becomes because each believer, each one of us have been entrusted. If we are saved, we've been entrusted with the saving gospel message because we've received it. So since we've received it, we also possess it to share it as well. So we've been given talents as servants of this talent of the gospel. And each time we share the gospel, we're being faithful stewards. But statistics tell us this, that many believers, somewhere around 85% of believers, will live and die without ever sharing the gospel with one other person. That means that 85% of Christians are that one talent servant that goes out, that takes the gospel, takes salvation for themselves, and goes out and buries it in a hole and never seeks to invest it in others to see return for God's kingdom. Begins to look a little bit more serious now, doesn't it? And what's happening, that whole time that that's buried away, all these people that you're coming in contact with in your family and at your job place and wherever it is you come in contact with, you've got the message of life, but you keep it buried in a hole and never share it. So there's evangelistic stewardship as well. There's a stewardship of our family and our relationships. So many times scripture reminds us that those closest to us are actually matters of stewardship in our lives. Husbands, we're told to love our wives Like Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself for it. Gave himself for it. Parents were commanded in Deuteronomy to teach our kids as as we walk by the way, using everything that we can to point them to seeing God in his true nature and to seeing the Father. And faithfully executing that as a matter of perspective. If we're just looking at our family as something that just developed through a life process, I fe- I, chemicals happen and I fell in love with this person and then more chemicals happen and we had kids. And it's just like, this is just the normal outflow of life. We don't understand the fact that these relationships are things that we need to invest spiritual truth into. 
and that there is a spiritual component to all of those things because it didn't happen just by life process. It happened by God's guidance and God's blessing. See, so many more places that God says we are to be stewards. Different places. Will I give an honest day's work for an honest day's wage? That my testimony at the workplace is actually an act of stewardship. How I view the money that I have on t- outside of the 10%, what do I do with that? The talents and the gifts that we've been given. For example, our worship team up here, we are blessed to have some talented musicians and talented vocalists here. And what they do is not just for them. What they do blesses the body and glorifies the Father. But what if they took that talent and said, you know what, I can play guitar, but I'm just going to do a little picking and grinning at home in the privacy of my own home. Nobody else needs to hear that. Or some of our vocalists said, you know what, I'm going to use this really for my own glory, so I'm going to go out and I'm I'm not going to sing about God. I don't want to sing on the worship team. I'm going to go out and I'm going to try to make myself famous. I'm going to be the next Taylor Swift. As if you can ever be another Taylor Swift, right? Okay, I'm just teasing. As if there could ever be another Taylor. You see, it's what we do with what God has given us and whether what we do brings him glory or not. Now, that's not to say you can be famous or you can, you can, you can gain a, a worldwide attention for the gifts that God has given you. That's not, there's nothing wrong with it, but what do you do with that to point to the Lord? Jesus clearly calls his church to faithfulness and having an undying loyalty to him too. You say, man, that's tough. I don't know if I can, if I can give everything to him. Well, here's what he said to the church at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2. He said, we need to be faithful, just as faithful when things are going badly as when they are going well. In Revelation chapter 2, it says, write to the angel of the church at Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who is dead and came to life. I know your affliction. I know your poverty, but you are rich. He said, look, I know you're in in poverty, but in me, you are rich. He said, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Oh, hold on. Suffer? Glad he was just talking to Smyrna, right? (laughs) <laughs> wrong look what he says look the devil's about to throw some of you into prison to test you and you will experience affliction for 10 days be faithful to the point of death and i will give you the crown of life let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the spirit says to the churches the one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death see we were talking a little bit in bible study on friday about this too about how in our context we talk about suffering and persecution, but we really don't know what it's like in, in, compared to that, right? Not, a lot of us, we say, oh, there may come a day when we get thrown in prison for our faith, and there very well may, but for, to, for now it hasn't. And here's the thing. We have the freedom to be bold about our faith, but we're not bold. 85% of us are zero boldness of our faith. But over in the other parts of the world, we're talking about this a little bit in one of the books that, that we've both read is that, you know, a missionary was over, an American missionary is over in China and said, you know, some of you may be thrown into prison and everybody started laughing and they all said, yeah, I've been thrown three or four times. Like you had to be in prison to be in this club at one point. We don't understand persecution like that, but it doesn't mean that the words of Jesus that promised that everyone who follows Christ will suffer persecution or will suffer for his namesake. It doesn't mean that that's not true. We all suffer to different degrees and to different, uh, different, different ways. See, books like the Fox's Book of Martyrs and uh, the Insanity of God, they highlight just how faithful people have been in the midst of severe persecution. But for each one of us, we're told by Christ, we will. He says this in John 16. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, though, because I've overcome the world. He wasn't just talking to the disciples there. Every follower of Christ will have suffering of some level, to some degree. I dare say if we went around here, some of you would say, I've lost friendships because of Jesus. Or, I've sacrificed, I've, I've given when I didn't necessarily have it to give for the sake of Christ. I definitely sacrificed sleep on Sunday. Or time on Sunday. You see, we all have these levels But he says, be confident because I've overcome all of that. We may not suffer in the same degree as somebody else, but it's promised reality that we will live in Christ. We will suffer for him as well. So we should be faithful and be loyal, even in the midst of hardship as we are when it's good. But we should also invest in those who are faithful. We should be faithful to invest in those who are faithful as well. 2 Timothy tells us this. 
what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who are, who are able to teach others also. This is why when we give of our tithes and offerings, pieces of that, and then we also give above and beyond that to missions. That's why we have a bake sale to raise money for missions to help those who are faithful as well, that we are faithful to bless those who are faithful to bless others with the gospel. And we help with missions and other things. So we need to understand that faithfulness is just the reasonable response. It's just a reasonable response to the faithfulness that God has shown us as well. And we need to wrap up here in just a second, so I'm going to move quick. Our current faithfulness, the next point is our current faithfulness creates opportunities for future faithfulness as well. We saw that in our text, didn't we? When the, the master looks at the, the guys who, who turned into prophet, and he says, well done, good and faithful, faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, so I will make you faithful. I will give you more, right? Every act of faithfulness has a return on it. God rewards our faithfulness with, with what? <laughs> more chances to be faithful. So if we're looking at, at, at our requirement to be faithful as a drudgery <laughs> and we're faithful, guess what? More drudgery. But God responds not to the act of faithfulness, but to the heart of faithfulness. He will lay upon the faithful heart opportunities to be more faithful and more faithful and more faithful. This is a warning in, in, in Proverbs 28, 20. It says, a faithful person will have many blessings, but one in a hurry to get rich will not go and punish. It's a warning that we, if we want to cut corners with God, we can't do that. The process of faithfulness, has to, you have to trust the process. You have to go through it. You can't cut corners and you can't manufacture it. You have to trust God in that. Psalm 31 tells us this. It says, love the Lord, all his faithful ones. The Lord protects the loyal but fully repays those who are arrogant. So not only will the faithful be protected, but we also see God repays the unfaithful as well. And not in such good terms. Not in good terms. So as we close out this morning, there's one more important truth about faithfulness that we can't miss, and this one is really important. This is one that we really need to take home with us and understand. Is that faithfulness is not about how much you have, but it's about what you do with what you have. It's about what we do with what we have. See, it can be really easy to look at these passages and be like, man, God's just all about production. God's just all about like turning out the product. No, he's all about our faithfulness. He's all about us being faithful with what he has given us. And when he knows he can trust us, then we have more to be faithful with. But it's not about amassing more. It's about being faithful and trusting God through, in, through all of it great example of that is with the story of the widow who only put in two little, two little pennies in the offering plate. One day Jesus was hanging out in the temple and his disciples were with him there in the temple and he was standing over by the offering box that was in the temple. See, in the temple they didn't pass a plate either. They were post-COVID, before COVID, right, with their offering, okay? So he's standing back by the offering box in the temple, and it was, it was, we know it was a metal box, probably a black lock box that, you know, sat back by the back door. No, I'm just teasing. Um, but it was because every time, the Bible says, every time somebody would come and put an offering in, which they didn't have paper money back then, and they didn't have, like, you know, text to give and all that type of stuff. So when you gave your offering, it caused attention. And the, the rich people loved it. Because they come in and they like have their big boxes and they pour it out. And it's like this big loud clanging sound all over the temple that echoes throughout the temple. And they're like, yep, millionaire Eddie, he gave again. That's good. And so Jesus is watching them come up. And it says he's just standing there over there by that box. And he's just observing. He's just watching it. He's not doing anything. And he watches the rich people come up and put. And it just made this loud sound. And then this little widow comes shuffling up. And she gets down in her purse and she pulls out two little pennies. And it makes hardly a sound as two little pennies, clink, clink, drop in. And as she walks away, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I want you to take note of something. Look at verse number 43 of Mark chapter 12. So summoning his disciples, he said to them, truly I tell you this, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. For they have gave out of their surplus, but she gave out of her poverty everything that she had. All that she had to live on. Said she gave her very last penny. Why did she do that? 
Don't know all of her motivations. I guarantee you, though, there was a little bit of faithfulness in that. There was a little bit of faith and trust that God would provide and take care of her. You know how we know this? Because Jesus, God himself, says this poor widow has done more than any of them. See, we get caught up in big and flashy things, especially in our Western culture. We look and we think, man, if it's big and if it's well-known, it must be good. It must be blessed. Not always. Because God blesses the heart of faithfulness. It's not about how much we have. It's about what we do with what we have and how much of what we have we actually say belongs to God. See, those who give out of their surplus, the temptation is, I'm not saying that's what they do, but the temptation is to say, okay, God, I'll give you this, but I'm not going to give you to the place where it causes me to trust you for the next thing. I'll give out of what I can afford to give and it not affect what I feel is secure over here. But she, she gave everything. It was about what she did with what little she had. All of us are challenged to be equally faithful regardless of how much we have to be faithful with. This is why God is such a righteous master. See, when those, when those guys came back with the talents, he didn't, expect, he didn't expect the guy with two talents to have ten just like the guy who had five to start with. He was just as pleased with his four talents because he only had two to start with. And if that guy with one talent had come back with two, he would have been just as pleased with him. But look at this other servant that we saw, we saw in, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 24 when we opened up with those two verses. I, I saved these last verses because they're, they're, they're pretty difficult. But I want you to see uh, this because I think this is something that we really have to apply uh, to the church today as we are seeking to be faithful. The wicked servant, Matthew 24. Let's read again in verse number 45. <laughs> it says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. We read that part. That's a good principle. Blessed is the servant that, finds, that his master finds doing his job when he comes. Now, blessed is that servant. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions if we're faithful. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him at an hour he does not know. Well, obviously, because if he's drunk, he's not paying attention to when the master's coming back. Here's what the master will do. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, Derek, thanks for leaving us with such a warm image to carry to lunch dismemberment. Glad I came. Glad the kids are with me. I can see at lunch now, kids, what really stuck out to you about the, about the message? Well, it was the dismemberment for me, Dad. Good luck explaining it. All right, the point here is to see just what the servant did that was so egregious. Before we get caught up in all the bad stuff, let's think about what was so egregious about what the wicked servant did. The wicked servant squandered the time while the master was away to do his job and decided, since the master's away, I'll just play. And who suffered for that? The master. And everybody else that the master served. All the other servants as well. What did he do? He partied up so much, and what did he do? It says he went out and he beat his fellow servants. What did that, what did that accomplish? Well, I'll tell you what it did. It made them less productive in their faithfulness to the master as well. And so then overall, his, uh, his, his idea wasn't just that I'm going to not be productive, but I'm going to make everybody else around me not productive too. I'm going to distract them too. Here's how this plays out today for us, I think, as the church. As a church, we have to be very careful that we don't beat each other while we should be faithfully working together in order to be about the master's work. See, God is given the church he's given us this beautiful talent of the gospel he's given us the message of the gospel to sow far and wide but what do we constantly hear coming out of churches so many times the church is known more for what we're against and who we're against than what we're for and what we're about and we also through centuries have spent most of our time beating up one another because i don't agree on this or i don't agree on that and we beat one another up and distract one another from the real work that we need to be doing of sharing the gospel with those outside of the walls. 
See, I'm a firm believer that if we focus on reaching people with the gospel outside of the walls, God through the Holy Spirit is going to make sure that he takes care of the unity inside the walls because if we're focused with God's heart on his heart for others, he's going to fix our heart on our heart for each other. I I can't say it again. Don't ask me to repeat it. If it didn't make sense, that's cool. Just let it lay. Again, the church of Christ has been given this message has been given this ability to grow the kingdom of God, and we've been given all we need to invest, and it all comes from him. All we need to do is share it. But will we be like that one who says, I've got it, I'm just going to bury it? Will we be like that, that, this one who says, you know what, I want to do my own thing. I want to do my own thing. I'm going to be so distracted by all this other stuff that I forget what's actually important to the master. This is why faithfulness is a word that guides us as a body to be faithful to him because he is returning and we will have to give a report so the question is are we being faithful so to close out i want us to consider the truths and the warning we are servants of the most high god and that's a good thing we're given a responsibility to faithfully manage the blessings that he's given us and he's going to reward our faithfulness as he sees fit which will always be more than we could imagine and we need to be mostly concerned with what we do with what we have rather than how much more we're getting and how much more we're amassing, but are we being faithful with what God has given? We also need to heed the warning to be careful not to waste the chances and not to waste the opportunities that we have to be faithful because there will be regret in many different forms. So as we bow our heads and we close our eyes this morning and we get ready for a time of invitation, I just want to ask,